The wind hammered the bus windows, causing it to heave and sway over the yellow line. It was going to be another irritating day of snow squalls designed by a mean god to distort Frank's sense of distance and proportion. But the mickey of rum under the driver's seat would liquefy everything into a fluid account of what his life could have been. When Bonnie had walked out on him, he was gutted, but not particularly surprised. Actually, he'd been waiting for it. After Ben died, she'd changed, but to be honest and fair, so had he. That boy was absolutely everything to her. He never wanted a kid himself, but there was something about little Ben that got inside you, made you want to be a man and his strong, unwavering protector. Then it all changed a week after Ben turned two. He started falling down for no reason. His eyes stopped focusing, and when he took the first seizure, Frank, the strong, unwavering protector, disappeared to be replaced by Frank, the drunken, cowardly bastard. By the time Ben had his second tumor removed, he'd abandoned them both. One day, after an argument with Bonnie about his drinking, she'd slapped him. He just couldn't get past the way she looked at him with a mixture of hatred and disappointment. The next day, he packed some clothes and left for good, couch surfing with friends until he finally moved into a basement apartment, unfurnished except for a framed picture that Bonnie had taken of Benny sleeping beside him during their last Christmas Eve together. Frank pulled over to the shoulder of the road and turned off the bus engine. He slid his hand under the seat to retrieve the mickey taking four good swigs, one for each of his failures. He felt the familiar cascading burn of the rum, transcending the lies of his life, and filling his chest with a calm superiority that, for a while, made him truly believe he no longer gave a shit about anything. But then the other memories intruded, the older ugly times that always marched in angry and unannounced. They were so real he could actually smell the mold and stink of the shack where he was reared, and the sound of his mother's relentless pacing at night when his father went missing for days at a time. He could still see him passed out and bleeding by the side of the road, while his mother, still in her nightdress, grabbed his father's arms, and ten-year-old Frank took his legs. Into the house they went, dropping him beside the bed, because neither of them had the strength to lift him. What odds, his mother said. He'll probably shit himself anyway, and I don't want that filth in the sheets. Let him sleep off as drunk like the dog he is, on the floor. In the night, his father would come to and sing out for his mother. Maureen, come help me up. Maureen, where are you too? But his mother never answered, although Frank could hear her stir and knew that she was wide awake. As always, he was left to lie in the nightly squalor of his own piss and vomit. The next day, like clockwork, he'd be gone again. Frank's mother would be on her hands and knees with a bucket and a brush, scrubbing the floorboards, cursing both God and the devil for her lot in life. Frank always escaped her by squirreling himself away in the shed where he'd smoke the cigarette butts he'd collected from the old coffee can his Uncle Chris kept by the back door. Even from this distance in time, he could still hear his mother cursing, waging war with the men who had let her down. His father died the following December, and when they found him on his back in front of the Christmas tree, he was clutching his chest with one hand while holding a crumpled $10 bill in the other. Frank's mother pried it loose from his fingers before the doctor arrived and stashed it down the top of her dress. She used it to buy a turkey for his wake. Frank took the last swallow from the mickey, draining the contents to blur the memories and dirty emotions that feasted on them like parasites. He tossed the empty bottle out the window and started the bus. The kids would be ready for pickup in 15 minutes, and it was going to take him at least 10 to get there. One more late complaint was all that grimy prick Strickland needed so he could fire him. Frank put an angry foot on the gas pedal, wondering if the bus would hit a patch of ice and not caring much if it did. The bus careened down the main road, past the farm and his cousin Jimmy's house, where Frank had been sleeping off a bender the day little Benny had died. It was stormy then, too, the wind howling like a hungry dog on the prowl. By the time he'd sobered up and gotten to the hospital, his son had slipped away, surrounded by everyone except his father. When Frank walked into Ben's room, his sister-in-law spit in his face before walking out, while Bonnie lay sobbing across their son's tiny body. Instead of facing it, he ran from the hospital, not seeing Bonnie again until the funeral. He couldn't explain why he wasn't able to do it, to help her. He just didn't have it in him. Frank was starting to sweat and shake again by the time he reached his destination. Turning into the school parking lot, he felt relieved. The noisy kids were a welcome and needed distraction from himself. Once the youngsters were loaded on, he'd be calm again. 
The other drivers hated the ruckus the kids made, always bawling at them to shut up, but Frank found the din they created a cure for the poison thoughts that crept in through the holes and cracks in his silent purgatory. The school doors opened, the kids sp spilled out in small cliques. The boys were showing off like peacocks, bellowing and roughhousing in the snow, while the girls whispered in a conspiracy of adolescent shyness. Ben could have been one of those boys now if he'd lived. Just as this thought threatened to flood Frank's heart with renewed anguish, a group of boisterous 13-year-old boys tramped up the steps, making fun of each other, yanking him back to reality. When the bus was full, Frank pulled onto the main road. Traffic coming out of the city was heavier than usual, and navigating around the other vehicles taking every bit of Frank's concentration. With the rum in his blood and the fists of wind pummeling the side of the bus, it was proving almost impossible to stay in his lane. By the time he reached the final part of his route, only 10 of the 25 kids remained. Moving through snow squalls and turning onto the next road, Frank took the corner too tight, nearly colliding with a pickup truck, but he soon righted the bus, congratulating himself on finessing a close call. The wind continued to rock the bus, but it moved along at a good pace, and Frank was enjoying the banter in the back, glad it was the weekend and nearly the end of his shift. His black cloud mood was lifting, and for a moment he felt like he did before Ben got sick. As the bus approached the stoplight, the front left tire hit a patch of black ice, sending it hurtling into the intersection. Before there was time for thinking or fear, Frank collided with a woman and her baby going southbound in a minivan. Frank tried to control the skid, but it was too late. As the bus spun, Frank was catapulted through the windshield before it rolled over, landing on its right side in the middle of the road. Broken bits of shattered, bloody glass covered the both lanes. Into the evening, emergency crews and police worked diligently in the worst part of a storm that ravaged the city that no longer raged within Frank Sullivan. <laughs>